It's January again, which means we've hit the doldrums of game releases. And while I've got a really big backlog of games from 2014 I still need to eventually get to, I figured we could kick off 2015 with some lighter fare. Games criticism history! And I promise it'll be slightly less boring than that sounds. Although a lot of this is pretty old hat, if you do pay attention to game critic circles, I figure it might be interesting to people who don't keep abreast of that kind of thing. If nothing else, I'll try to show some interesting game footage so we can have some shiny things to look at. Anyways, if you hang around games writers and academics long enough, you might hear them mention the ludology narratology debate. And often debate will have scare quotes around it. Like, really, really big scare quotes, which we'll get to in a bit. But because of those scare quotes, I'm always antsy talking about the debate. It tends to be a bit of a masturbatory exercise, because if you have heard of it, you know it's sort of bunk, and if you haven't heard of it, one tends to get blank stares in response to bringing it up. But I still think it's important to understanding a lot of the discussions in game criticism now, because while the debate ostensibly never happened, we still feel the reverberations of the misunderstanding today. So until fairly recently, the study of games and the study of play exclusively fell under any number of existing disciplines. Heisengut and Kewa wrote about games from an anthropological and sociological perspective. Studies on the impact of games on individuals were the domain of psychology, and economics had game theory to toy with rational actors and decision-making. And you had humanities writers who studied story and the structure of narrative who occasionally dipped their toe into games. You know, stuff like how Mario or Zelda loosely fit Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, or how the overall arc of a narrative tends to to be reflected in the difficulty of a game's levels. That field of studying narrative and story is referred to as narratology, primarily because that's the lens they use to look at, well, all storytelling mediums. Narratology wants to ask questions about how stories are built and told, how narrative structure conveys meaning, and the boundaries between story and plot. Anyways, over the course of the 90s and into the early 2000s, there were a bunch of game designers, game critics, and media theorists who started looking at games and asking similar questions. What does it mean to play? Are there different kinds of play? How can we structure play to be productive or expressive or enriching? And when they looked for answers, what they found was frustrating. Tons of research and writing about game mechanics, play, and the nature of games had been done, but it was scattered under all those various disciplines. Want to talk about degenerate strategies? That's more of an economic game theory thing. Want to talk about the social role of play and the nature of the magic circle? That's more of a sociology thing. Want to talk about the structure of the story of Ultima? That's more of an erotology thing. It became clear that what was needed was a combined discipline to examine how we play in the same way narratology could combine literary theory, sociology, history, and more to examine narrative structure and construction. I'll quote the game scholar Gonzalo Frasca. The term narratology had to be invented to unify the works that scholars from different disciplines were doing about narrative. The research about games and play is in a similar situation. The topics have been broadly studied from different disciplines, for example, psychology, anthropology, economy, and sociology. However, these studies are generally independent, focusing on small characteristics and without looking for bigger patterns of understanding. We will propose the term ludology, from ludus, the Latin word for game, to refer to the yet non-existent discipline that studies game and play activities. Just like narratology, ludology should be independent from the medium that supports the activity. This definitely needed to happen. We needed the ability to point to game studies in the same way that we could point to film theory or musicology. But I think this plea for a new field is also where the first bit of confusion begins to crop up that forms the basis of the whole ludology versus narratology thing. What was being proposed was a whole new discipline. Just as narratology explored the structure and use of stories regardless of the medium, ludology sought to explore the nature of play itself regardless of whether it was a video game, a sport, a board game, or non-systemic abstract play. But somehow what a lot of people heard was that ludology was born in opposition to narratology, that it was a way of looking at games that made the play, the mechanics, the prime focal point, as opposed to narratologists who presumably only cared about the story of games. In this warped definition, the two sides were sort of warring over how to look at games. The narratologists would take their stories and the ludologists would take their mechanics and ne'er the twain shall meet. And it's not really clear how that transformation from proposed discipline to warring structural analyses happened, though I have my totally unofficial, non-academic, and probably wrong guess. First, this all took place not long after the Sillywood era of games, which is a show for another day. And there was a lot of apprehension about games as movies and an almost reactionary refocusing on games as systems first and foremost. This was the period where adventure games were being put to pasture, where traditional Hollywood storytelling was viewed with suspicion, and when games like Quake 3 and Deus Ex had everyone talking about purity of design and emergent play rather than narrative themes. So when the term ludology came along, it sort of got co-opted by certain design aesthetics that were being refocused on systems and that downplayed stories. 
Also, another potential vector for the confusion? Because this was happening in the early 2000s, a lot of the professors involved had blogs, and those blogs would get referenced by game designers or games critics, whose articles would then get referenced elsewhere, and somewhere along the game of telephone, a lot of the context was lost. But what made sense in an academic paper became something else entirely eight references down the road when it got copy pasted onto a 4chan or NeoGAF. But whatever the reason, the popular impression, especially as you moved away from academia, was that there were two schools of thought about how games worked. Which team are you on? Narratology or ludology? Are games about systems or are games about stories? Internet debates along these lines about the nature of games would crop up constantly for the next few years, and things eventually got so bad that Gonzalo Frasca had to write a piece named Ludologists Love Stories 2, Notes from a Debate That Never Took Place. Hey, we have a title. The thrust of that piece wasn't just that the proposal of the term ludology clearly wasn't meant to be in opposition to narratology, but that narratologists were kinda a boogeyman in game circles. Like, narratology as a field exists, and narratologists who write about narratives exist, and narratologists who have occasionally written about video games exist. But where were these groups of narratologists writing about how games are exclusively a narrative medium? They didn't really exist, in no small part because, as Frasca put it, off-the-shelf narratological theories are unable to work well with games. There really were no monstrous narratologists hiding under the ludologists' beds. And over time, academia moved on, happy to put a weird, non-issue to rest. There never was a story versus mechanics debate, so we can all just move on with our lives. So if all of this is just a misunderstanding of academic jargon that got cleared up in a paper from 2004, why am I still talking about it? Well, because in a certain sense, the fallout from the misunderstanding never really went away. I don't know if the ludology narratology debate actually shaped discourse, or if it simply highlighted an undercurrent of something that had been there far longer and was bubbling up at the exact same time. But in its wake, we began talking about gameplay and story as separate things. The gameplay is good, but the story kind of sucks. The story is great, but it's a shame about the gameplay. Regardless of what academia went on to do, the popular discourse about games kept the two things sharply divided. We adopted this way of thinking about games as systems or as stories, but never as both, and it's been influencing the way we talk and write about games ever since. The quintessential example of this, and I'm even more loath to bring this up because these days it's even more taboo than the ludology narratology thing, is ludonarrative dissonance. Yes, yes, Latin roots are funny, pluto garrative fusion dance, whatever. It's usually brought up as a joke by game pundits nowadays, but the term actually started being mocked by the public at large, just as its utility was being questioned by actual games critics. Ludonarrative dissonance was originally coined by game dev Clint Hawking back in 2007 to describe a problem he saw with Bioshock. Basically, he noticed that the narrative of Bioshock was trying to critique the selfish nature of objectivism, that the ruins of Rapture argued that a society built only on self-interest was doomed to fail. But he felt that conflicted with the gameplay, which was all about obtaining power and wealth for the self at the expense of others. The story was over here doing one thing, and the gameplay was over here doing something else, and they were fighting. See, it's games as systems in conflict with games as narrative all over again. And it's only in the past few years that critics have realized that that's kind of weird, right? Like, story and play both exist in service to the overall work, not as two forces in conflict with one another. So why do we frame them that way? It'd be like going to the movies and then afterwards talking with friends about how the film worked as a story, and then talking about how the film worked as an example of cinematography, but never at the same time. You'd never do that, and definitely not in a way that would posit a film as cinema narratively dissonant. If the framing of the shots or the lens selection sucked and didn't help what the film was trying to do, we say that. If the story sucked, but the cinematography was still pretty amazing, we say that. We look at the work and what the work is trying to do and analyze the individual contributions to the whole, but we don't look at film as a series of framed shots and, separately, as a narrative. So why should we act like a game has to be viewed as a system or, separately, a narrative? And that's why the term is being eased out of most critics' vocabulary, though you'll definitely still see it pop up on occasion. But even with that term put to bed, we still have this way of thinking about games as systems or stories that persists. You need look no further than the recent debates of the past few weeks. The terms ludocentrism and ludofundamentalism have been proposed by critics Austin Howe and Stephen Byrne to describe critical approaches that put clear preference to a game's systems over its thematic or narrative content. You know, that game has a really great story, but the combat sucks, so the game as a whole sucks. That in turn rankled designers like Keith Bergen and Frank Lance, who favor an approach that focuses on systemic depth and mechanical interaction. Lance's response 
could probably have been more amiable, chastising attempts to read game narratives by lamenting, quote, pretend worlds and childish make-believe, imaginary dragons, badly written dialogue, and unskippable cutscenes. Yeah, for a non-debate, this can get kind of heated. Regardless, exactly how much of a game is systems and how much of a game is story and how much we should weigh both of them is still a hot-button issue in some circles of criticism. The ludology narratology non-debate probably didn't cause this divided way of thinking about games, but I think it marks the flashpoint of its birth. And at the end of the day, games have stories, whether they're procedural or embedded stories. And games have systems, whether they're a focal point of what the game's trying to do or not. Games are Elegy for a Dead World, with its focus on freeform writing prose and rejection of mechanical interaction. Games are Geometry Wars, with its focus on abstract mechanical precision and no real story. And games are everything in between. We have to stop with this obsession of trying to put story and gameplay in opposition to one another. We have to see that both contribute to the value of a work, but neither form the entirety of a work. Some games might be more story-focused, and some might be more mechanically inclined, and some might mix the two really well. But we have to look at what each game is trying to do and address it on its own terms, instead of coming up with broad, sweeping declarations about how all games should work. And maybe understanding the history of that false divide will help us recognize that going forward.